a rumble, a summer shower, a beep, a cooked meal, a melody, a reinforcement. We have learned that these things somehow go together. Another example. I got a speeding ticket <laughs> not too long ago. And I noticed that for a while after that, I was feeling very nervous whenever I saw a police officer or a police car. I was getting like this kind of racy feeling, you know. Why? Well, because a stimulus which in and of itself isn't very stimulating, that is, a police car, had been paired recently with something that was very stimulating, namely a huge fine. When you pair a stimulus that's not very important and doesn't produce much of a reaction with another stimulus that produces a huge reaction, there's a spread of effect from the important stimulus to the unimportant stimulus. That is classical conditioning. It's the simplest type of learning there is. The story of classical conditioning begins with the classic experiments of Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov. In the early 1900s, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for research he had done on how the digestive system works in dogs. Pavlov stumbled into his groundbreaking findings quite by accident. He was studying the salivary response of dogs to different types of foods. So he's got the dog basically in restraints. He's got a cannula connected to the salivary gland. Uh, Pavlov would put some food, or is actually a food powder, in a dog's mouth. He'd collect saliva from the dog. He noticed that something was happening with these dogs. When the lab assistant would come into the room, the dog would start salivating before the meat ever made it to the dog's mouth. They were demonstrating very powerful principles of learned behavior, and soon Pavlov realized he had come across a very important finding. Conditioning is the process of learning associations. The dogs had learned to associate two stimuli, the sound of footsteps and food, and their automatic response was to salivate. Pavlov's experiments demonstrate the four basic elements of classical conditioning, which he identified. First, you have your unconditioned stimulus. In this situation, the unconditioned stimulus is the plate of food. This is a stimulus that will reliably produce a naturally occurring reaction in the organism. Next, you have the unconditioned response the salivation of the dog. This is a reaction that is reliably produced by the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus, the food. Pavlov called these unconditioned stimuli and responses because they occur naturally. Food is a natural biological stimulus and salivation is an automatic reflex response. They are unlearned or unconditioned. Pavlov replaces sound of footsteps in the hallway with something systematic like the ringing of a bell. And so he has a paradigm in which a bell is rung, food is presented. After a few trials like this, the dog salivates when the bell is rung. The bell converts from a neutral stimulus to one that through conditioning triggers the response of salivation. Classical conditioning can occur at different levels. For example, if I start with some powerful, biologically important stimulus like food, pair a neutral stimulus with that, such as a bell, remember there's a spread of effect from the important stimulus to the neutral stimulus. So now my neutral stimulus is no longer neutral. The question is, can I now pair the bell with a neutral stimulus and see that spread of effect occur again? That's called second order conditioning. Yeah, you can. Once I have this new reflex, this conditional reflex, that means I have a new stimulus that produces its own response. What happens if I repeat the presentation of that stimulus over and over and over again without pairing it with the biologically important stimulus, with the unconditional stimulus? And the answer is, it becomes less and less and less effective. This illustrates extinction, which is the decline of the conditioned response. Even after a conditioned response was extinguished, Pavlov noticed something interesting. 
If he allowed the dogs to have a brief rest period after extinction and then presented them again with the conditioned stimulus, they displayed a spontaneous recovery of their conditioned response. The bell triggered salivation just as before. So, take this to a practical level. This is exactly what John B. Watson and his student Rosalie Rayner did in a study they published in the 1920s. Pavlov's studies excited behaviorists like John B. Watson. Like Pavlov, Watson believed that psychology should focus on the objective scientific study of observable behaviors rather than the subjective interpretations of feelings, memories, or emotions. So Watson initiated a controversial series of experiments involving a nine-month-old boy dubbed Little Albert. Watson presented Little Albert with a variety of stimuli, a white rat, a dog, a rabbit, various masks, and a burning newspaper. Albert's reaction in most cases was curious indifference. Well, what they do is to pair the presentation of the animal. So you present this fairly neutral stimulus. Behind the toddler on the wall is this big iron bar. Just as he reaches out for the animal, the steel bar is struck. Which produces a very strong reaction of fear. After several repetitions, Albert began to show what's called stimulus generalization. He's afraid of other stuff, other small animals, a white furry coat, and famously for psychology, a Santa Claus mask. Watson believed that the basic laws of learning were the same for all organisms, from rats to dogs to humans, and that almost all human behavior was a result of conditioning. He argued that the goal of psychology was to predict and control behavior through scientific study. And he was, in a sense, rebellious. Uh, he already had envisioned that there might be a psychology that looked different than the psychology that existed. So in some ways, this tradition was one of psychology's super success stories. In other ways, what happened is that the early behaviorists, I, clearly especially Watson, kind of underestimated the complexity of the human condition, and now we know a bazillion things that just aren't what Watson was thinking back then. One of the areas glossed over by behaviorists is evolution. That an organism is biologically prepared to learn certain associations is another piece of the puzzle. What shapes this predisposition to react to specific stimuli over millions of years of evolution? If we look around, we see that our lives are full of classically conditioned responses. And most of them have deep cognitive roots in values and expectations passed down over millennia. 